Hi, this is Mark Wiltshire, and thanks for choosing to listen to the Explore Finland radio show. This episode was recorded when I went to visit Kuro Distillery Company in nearby Isokuro. This was a suggestion from one of my listeners, Keith, who's recently become one of the co-presenters with me on the Finnish Football Show podcast, so thanks, Keith, for the suggestion. I visited Kuro Distillery with Satu, expecting an introduction to the company and a quick tour of the distillery. Two and a half hours later, we'd received a history lesson about the village of Isokuro, learned about the formation and the first five years of Kuro Distillery Company, and spent 90 minutes on a tour of the distillery itself. So I had enough for a two-part episode. This is the first episode about the history of the village and the story of the company with Mikko Heinila, co-founder of Kuro Distillery. I'll release a follow-up in about a week's time, where we go on the distillery tour with Kalle Valkonen, head distiller and another co-founder of the company. So let's head over first to my conversation with Mikko. Okay, today I'm here at Kuro Distillery. I'm with Mikko Heinila. Um, he's going to be telling the story of Kuro Distillery. And then later we're going to hand over to one of his partners, Kalle Valkonen, who's going to tell me uh, a little bit more about the process going on here uh, in the background, I'm joined by Lady Satu. She's taking photos, but probably won't say anything on the camera, uh, on the microphone. And we're outside at the moment, so you can hear cars and motorbikes going past. It's all staying in. Um, but Mikael, thanks for having me here today. Of course. Welcome. Welcome to Isokura. Welcome to Kyra Distillery. Kyra Distillery and welcome to Kyran Matkalun Edistämiskeskus, which is the visitor center of our distillery. That's a nice snappy name that you've chosen for your for your visitor center here. But thank you. It's uh, we've chosen a beautiful day. It's early spring, 2019. The sky is blue. The sun is out, and it's going to last like this all through the summer, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> this is what we have ordered, at least. <laughs> so where where are we? We're on the banks of the river Isokura. Tell me a little bit about where we where we are. What where, where exactly is Isokuro and this particular location? Yeah, actually, uh, Isokuro is between Vasa and Seinäjoki on the west coast of Finland, and uh, it's half an hour drive from Vasa and from Seinäjoki. So it's uh, nicely also uh, beside the trail road, so you can stop by at Tervajoki, and that's only ten kilometers from the distillery. So really, really handy on those terms. But uh, what we have here in Isakura is a lot of history. And uh, I could start already from the Ice Age, but I'll cut some off. So, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not quite sure. I've got lots of memory on this recorder, but I'm not quite sure I've got enough to go from the Ice Age to the modern times. So, uh, But give me your selected history of Isakura. Great. I'll start then uh, 400 to 600 after Christ. So... Uh, to some extent, I'll I'll cut from the very beginning. Okay. <laughs> and uh, four kilometers from here, uh, towards Seinäjoki, there is a level of the swamp pit. They have found more than 100 skeletons from the swamp pit, uh, both genders, all ages, and nobody knows exactly why they have been put there. Uh, there are a lot of uh, kind of stories around it, uh, but uh, it, it, somebody mentioned something about this quite recently. Is this where there were a lot of bodies buried in a kind of like a water grave or something? Exactly. Okay. It's the same place. And uh, they, a few of those kind of skeletons, what they have found, uh, they were still intact and they are in a National Museum of Finland. And, um, but one of the stories that were kind of related to this one was uh, related to Kalevala. I'm not sure if you know this kind of old storybook of Finland. This is the Finnish national epic, isn't it? Exactly. I, I don't know it very well, and I think I've said that before on this <laughs> podcast. I don't know it very well. I still haven't read it, but I am aware of it. <laughs> it might be that uh, not too many Finns have actually read it, okay. So, but we just know bits and pieces of the stories. But uh, actually, that has been collected from uh, Karelia region. Um, but it seems like some of the kind of elements... And uh, the stories has been created or kind of uh, lived in uh, Turku region. Okay. And uh, there is uh, one phrase where it says that in, uh, or kind of uh, one story where it says that um, uh, in the northern part, in Pohjola, uh, they have put men to the s- uh, swamps. Ah, okay. And, uh, well, if you look from Turku region towards north, and if you think where they were putting people to the swamp so might this be then the 
Pohjola of Kalevala. Okay, it could be, couldn't it? So it's very already you're going back to the very the very kind of essence of the Finnish mythology almost. It's exactly. Very close to here in in Isokura. But uh well, nobody can say that it is or it isn't, but um then you might as well claim it for, as your own. <laughs> Why not? Exactly. But the thing was that uh, they were able to get some DNA of the bones and they were then doing the research if uh, nowadays Isakura people would be related to those uh, those guys and girls there over there. But uh, actually they found out that uh, they are not related and uh, the people who have put to those graves uh, were actually Sami people. Okay. So practically the aboriginals of Finland. Uh, so they used to live on this area but then when the westerners came they moved up north. But we still have also the name heritage from there. So, for example, a few hundred meters from here is a place called Jauri, which is in Sami language, lake. Okay, interesting. But um, let's move on a couple of se- centuries forward. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you'll get the... Or we can manage to do it within the battery. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, two kilometers down the stream, there is a Viking grave. Okay. So, uh, actually, back in the days, they considered that death is only a pathway to the next life. So, they put their king, so their leader, to the boat that he had. And then a couple of other fellows, a dork and a horse and uh, weapons and uh, jewelry. And then farming equipment. So, he was a farmer Viking. Okay. But there weren't that many stories written about these farmer Vikings. But nevertheless, uh, the curious part of it was that he wasn't just a farmer, kind of a staying local. Because one of the jewelry that they found, they have found two from the whole world, the exact the same. Uh, one from Isokura and one from UK. Okay, interesting. So yeah. he'd, he either connected to somebody, went to the UK, or he was a very early tourist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> which I guess the Vikings, the Vikings were. But, and... You say there was a burial here. What was the form of that burial? Well, the downside, especially to that horse and dog and those other two fellows, was that then they buried the ship. Right, OK. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit like the Egyptian burial, isn't it? Where where the the pharaoh was put into the tomb along with servants to see them into the into the next life. Exactly. But the, was the ship burned on the river? Uh, it was burned on the ground. Right, OK. Beside the river. Yeah. So that's how they found out all of the nails and then they could dig, uh, dig deeper uh, to find all of the other equipment yeah. and uh, jewelry and so on. Okay, interesting. But uh, let's move forward again uh, to 1304 and three kilometers down the stream. And there is the old church of Visokura. Uh Originally, they established a wooden church there. Then they made a sacristian from tiles and then they started to build a stone church around the wooden one. And then they tore down the wooden church the peculiar thing about this one well there's a lot of peculiarities but one of them being that uh, kind of the church municipality was Pohjankyrön suurpitäjä so well that was a huge one so it was 80 kilometers to one direction and uh, practically where if you happen to know where Turin Kyläkauppa this yes. big uh, village shop yes, as yeah. such is located to so also the guys and girls from there traveled all the way here to, to the church to go to church exactly uh, see this is interesting because last uh, last year Sato and I visited the church in Narpia uh-huh and they were telling the story then of people traveling a long way uh, to go to church and staying there for the weekend. And there were all these stables around the church at Narapia. Was there something similar here? Yeah, it okay. was kind of a church village all around. Yeah, yeah. Are there any of those um, stables or, or huts still there in Kura? Well, there are a couple of magazines and uh, there's a museum area uh, just beside it. So uh, the similar kind of old buildings are all around. Yeah. But the originals are those magazines. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, a lot of like really nice old buildings, but not the original ones that uh, used to be there. Sure, sure. Well, and if people want to see these kind of church surrounded by the buildings and, and hear, hear about this, then the previous, uh, previous episode uh, from 2018 uh, about Narpia Church would be a good place to, to go. But back to Kura. Yeah, so... Um, this uh, old church of Visakura, um, 
Well, there would be a lot of stories re- related all ho- also about the alcohol consumption, which was a bit different back in those days. <laughs> that is kind of related to us, but uh, uh, a lot of like really, really nice stories. But let's focus. And uh, uh, when they started, uh, the Latin was the language that the priests were, were talking. They changed it to Swedish at some point in time, so that made it easier for the locals. But on 1560, uh, Jakob Get was the priest, and he considered that we could enhance this a bit further. And he considered cartoons. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't know where this was heading, but I wasn't expecting you to say cartoons, so please. <laughs> so what they did, they painted the whole church with cartoons. So on the highest row, there goes like five and a one... Uh, one sorry, 1.5 meters tall. Uh, there goes the Old Testament around the church. Then on the middle row, there goes New Testament. Then and then the lowest one is the Holy Days of the Year. So then the local folks can just look at the paintings and try to map what is uh, what the priest is talking about to those paintings. Really? Uh, yeah. That's really in- that is really interesting. I've said this too many times already. <laughs> I need to find a better word. But that's uh, is that still there now? Uh, now it is. Okay. But what happened in, in between was that on 1666, uh, Isaac Brenner was the priest and uh, he covered those paintings with limes. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, whitewash. So um, that was actually a really good thing. Because? If they would have been visible 50 years after, they would have been destroyed. And why so? <laughs> you can read my face. I'm, try- I'm trying to let you let you talk without interrupting too much. But yeah, why so? So uh, we'll come to the year 1700, and uh, uh, from that year forward, there came it, uh, it became this uh, Great Northern War. So that is the war where all of the neighboring countries declared a war to Sweden. And uh, they just consider that Sweden is just a small country and uh, they can tear Sweden apart and distribute it amongst themselves. But what happened was that Sweden happened to have the best army in Northern Europe. And uh, it went the other way around. So Sweden was not only Sweden, but also like Finland, Norway, Denmark, north part of Germany, north part of Poland, Poland, uh, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia and the whole Eastern Europe back all the way down to Ukraine. Do you know, now now we're talking history and this is taking me back to my history because this was a subject that I studied in my A-level history ah. course. This was King Gustav Adolf. Yeah, um, or at least, um, I think we called him Gustavus Adolphus. I'm not quite sure what the, the name would be in Swedish. But yeah, the, the kind of the rise and fall of the Swedish Empire, which I think many people don't know so it, much about. Exactly. Um, so... What was the impact of that empire on on the, the church that you were talking about? Uh, well, um, it all went really well for Sweden for the first 10 years. But on the Battle of Poltava on 1709, the Russian forces were able to beat the Russian uh, Swedish army. And from there on, Russian took over practically the whole eastern part of uh, uh, Europe. And all the way, like, the most um, southern parts of Finland was, were practically handed over. Uh, Karl Gustav Garfeld uh, was nominated to be com- to be a commander of arms, and he wanted to fight for Finland. And uh, battle took place also in Kostian Virta, which is nearby Tampere. But there, six thousand men couldn't resist eighteen thousand men. So the remaining forces was taken to this part of the land. Uh, we were leaving February seventeen fourteen when the word came that the Russians are closing in. And uh, Arnfeld sent the word to all of the neighboring uh, um, municipalities that all men should gather here to the village of Napoe. Ah, so this is the Battle of Napoe. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Um, which is very close to where we're standing now. It's actually where we are standing it now. It is here, where we are now. Okay, interesting. And this name, Napoe, we'll, I think we'll probably come back to this a little bit later. But the, the, so the battle took place here. Exactly. Okay. So, um, on 16th of February, everything was ready. So, altogether, 5,500 men were uh, in the Swedish army. Most of them from, uh, nowadays, Finnish soil. And uh, there were uh, 1,068 peasants, if I if I remember exactly correct. And they were practically located right over here. So, uh, where our distillery is at the moment and uh, on the other side of the river where my house is. Okay. <laughs> You live on a historical site, pretty yes. much. Okay. 
<laughs> and uh, the main force was only uh, 400 meters from here to uh, up the river. And uh, they were standing there uh, on their formation. Uh, it was minus 25 degrees and snow over the knee, and they were waiting there for three days. Wow. I tell my parents that I've been out walking the dog for 20 minutes and it's minus and it's minus two and they think I'm crazy. So <laughs> that, that, sh- that kind of shows this Finnish characteristic that can only be su- summed up as sisu. <laughs> yeah. It's never, never giving up regardless of the of the uh, adversity that you're that you're up against. Exactly. Um, so after three days, the the op- opposing troops made it here. Exactly. So 6 a.m. in the 19th of February, 1714, they could see that the Russians are uh, uh, formating their troops on the left side, looking from here, so on the north bank of the river. Uh, They put their forces to kind of a triangular uh, position. So practically, uh, the Russian troops were 11,000 men strong. Uh, Swedish army was uh, 5,500 men strong. So if the battle would have started there, the whole push would have been on Arfeld's left flank. So that's why Arfeld needed to change the formation to counter the uh, Russian formation. The battle started. They both fired their cannons. They shot their muskets with joint shots. And then the close combat phase started by Swedish army. It looked really good. On the right-hand side, Uxkul's men were fighting fiercely. They were pushing the Russians behind. Some of them were already fleeing. They were even able to capture six of their cannons to their own ranks and put the formation back in line as it seemed like it was already won. But the Russians had such a lot of reserves. They could pull in the ranks as well. Also, they had sent uh, Russian Cossacks to go um, uh, through the Moses of Jauri to the left flank uh, and the backside of Finns and Swedes. So at the same time as uh, Swedish army saw that in the begin- uh, in front they didn't uh, the Russians didn't give up, they could find uh, Russian Cossacks behind them on left flank. Left flank started to fight them both ways. On right hand side, what happened was that uh, Delavara's cavalry was set to defend Napua village, which is 800 meters from here, and their task was to secure Napua village and the right flank. And uh, they had against them Chekin's Cossacks. But the reason unknown, De La Parra's cavalry backed away from the battlefield practically without a fight. So Chekin's Cossacks could ride through the Napua village to the right backside of Finns and Swedes, complete block and two hours of massacre. During those two hours, around 1,500 Russians were being killed and more than 3,000 Finns and Swedes were being killed. All of the local men could sit and bench. That was no longer than a few meters. That's all the, all the people that were left remaining in this area after the battle. Exactly. Wow. Okay. And uh, so it was practically complete devastation. You couldn't drink from the river for two years as there was such a lot of bodies in it. And if it only would have ended there, but the Russians wanted to make sure that this land will never ever fight against them anymore. So they started a period called Great Hate. Uh, they took one house to be their hospital. The old church of Visokura was taken as their stables. So if the paintings would have been visible, they would have been destroyed. Okay, yeah, interesting. And so the whitewash, I guess it, it literally protected them and somehow preserved them as well for, for future exactly. generations. So we were lucky on that front. That's a very dark story you've just told me. Mikko, but it, up, up until now, you've been smiling and telling these happy stories, and then it all got very dark. Yeah, and unfortunately, it gets even darker. Okay. So those two, two buildings remained. All of the other buildings were burned to the ground. Uh, women and children were considered to be merchandise, so most of them were taking as slaves to Russia. Anybody who could they put their hands on might have been captured, tortured, if they would have said that where they have any food or valuables, or then they tortured just to give an example to the others. During 1714, practically whole male population from Isokura was either captured or killed. Okay. So that was actually complete destruction of this area. But even though that was really grim times, we also there need to consider the positives. It wasn't the end of this area. This area was repopulated, rebuilt. 
and uh, 200 years after Finland got its independence and still on 1920 the memory was cherished and uh, they established a memorial stone of Napue 100 meters from here by the design of Matti Visanti. It's quite something I've heard of this battle but I've never heard the details before. I'd really like to try and find other local historians that can tell some of these stories. Um, I didn't know that's what we were going to talk about at the start of this <laughs> uh, this conversation today, but it's fascinating. I I love history. Satu here likes history. And I know that there's a lot of people out there that will just be hearing these stories and, and, and find it fascinating like I do. Yeah, it has been always kind of a, a really important part to me uh, I have always loved history and um, like my elementary school is practically on the other side of uh, battlefield. So I have been okay. hearing this story since I was a kid and I have kind of lived this story over and over again since then. And you very quickly brought us up from from the end of the 1700s to Finnish independence, which was 101 years ago. Exactly. Um, so we're moving into the modern the modern era. Yeah. Now. So now we're on, uh, let's start from the year approximately 1900. So in the river there was a king stone, a big stone, and uh, that needed to be taken out uh, from the river, so it was brought to this piece of land. At the same time in Isokura there were a couple of uh, like old-fashioned dairies, and they needed to build a joint one and a modern one. And it needed to be in the center geographically in Isokura, because everybody was bringing their milk in by horses. So you can't get mu- much more center than this place is. Yeah. So they took this place, uh, named it as Kingstone, and started to build the dairy from Kingstone. So it was it was known as Kingstone, and of course there's many places called Kingston mm-hmm. in Jamaica, mm-hmm. uh, very near to where I grew up in, just south of London. There's another one up in in Humberside. Um, what was the actual name it was given here? Was it a Finnish name or a Swedish name? Or It was a Finnish name. So it was called Kuningaan Kivi. Uh, so it's a li- literal translation, King's, exa- King's Stone. Yeah, okay. Exactly. And um, So essentially where we are now is it's not Kingston upon Thames or Kingston upon Hull. We're, we're at Kingston upon Kuro. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, yeah, well, the dairy was finalized 1908, and it has three stories within. So, first story is about uh, Isokira Nosus Meiri, so the co-op dairy of Isokira. Uh, they were doing really good cheese and butter from the very beginning, Edam cheese and so on. But actually, if we take really from the beginning, so they needed the milk from the other side as well. So they built this uh, Pertila suspension bridge, which is the eldest suspension bridge made of steel in Finland. That was finalized in 1910. We were just walking on the bridge to check it out. Um, and I think Satu probably will agree that this is the right time to give a little shout out to her friend, Elena Pertila, who is from Gura. Um, I'm not quite sure if it's her bridge, but it certainly has some connection to her family that are, are from here as well. So hi, Elu. I hope you're listening to this. I don't know if you listen, but I hope you're listening to this episode. You got a, a shout out today. Um, but but it's that we were reading a little bit about the about the bridge on the on the sign there. But please t- explain what it's what it's all about. Yeah. So um, well, that pretty much covers. There's a lot of stories re- related to the bridge as well. But uh, actually, uh, Elena is uh, living just across the river, so <laughs> hundred years from uh, hundred meters from here. I didn't know before today that you live the other side of the river. So obviously, <laughs> the, you know who we're who we're talking about. But, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, let's jump back to the dairy. So they were doing great uh, cheese and butter also for exports. But on 1979, Valio, the Finnish uh, dairy distributor, requested that if they could invent new kind of a cream cheese here. And they did. And it became fairly good. It became older money, which is the most uh, popular cream cheese in Finland nowadays. This is this is a very uh, it's an unusual style of cheese because it's like a a tall cylinder of cheese you know uh, round shaped but but quite tall that you get your cheese slice and slice from the from the top 
And there are many imitators as well out there, but there's only one original. But it's not a, a kind of cheese that I've seen in other other countries so it's some somehow it's it's like edam is dutch cheese and cheddar is from the uk and this ultimately seems somehow specifically finnish yeah cheese. that is true and uh i kind of really like that it's round because then you don't get any kind of dry corners or yeah, anything <laughs> that's true as well yeah yeah but uh yeah that was actually invented here and uh well it became really popular really fast. So that's why they needed to expand the dairy quite many times. They couldn't keep up with the production, so also some of all their money was produced in other dairies. And uh, then they started to export this cheese that was made here to Soviet Union, as it was a bit more creamy and a bit more salty. Okay. So I think it was better. Yes. <laughs> My personal opinion. Yeah. But uh, eventually what happened was that Soviet Union collapsed and so did the trade. And then Valia decided that they'll stop the production in this Ison Kyrnos um, Meijeri. Uh, and uh, that was the end of the story number one. Am I, am I right in thinking, though, that this building is featured on the, on the packaging for Oltomanni? It was there for years and years. But not anymore. Not anymore. So when the um, manufacturing was moved out from here, so after a couple of years, the uh, Isokura people were saying to Valio that, okay, there is a bit of a dilemma, so it's not being produced here anymore. So then uh, the picture was changed to where it is produced right, at okay. the moment. Okay, so <laughs> there is a certain resemblance, definitely. Then, uh, luckily, cheese champions continued, Justo Mestre con- continued their heritage, and um, then again, uh, they expanded until 2008, and then uh, the whole production was moved to Juustoportti. And that was pretty much the end of the dairy production here. There's a real heritage in this dairy industry from f- that, that sort of starts here, and some of it's gone to Valio, which is a huge producer of dairy products. And then the next, the next wave has moved to Juustoportti, which is more of a, a regional um, manufacturer, but, but also producing really high quality dairy products that I know they're also exporting overseas and all of them have their roots back here in Kura. Yeah, to some extent, yes. But then this was quiet for five years. Um, The whole area of uh, dairy was cut to kind of pieces and they were each property was sold uh, to different stakeholders, individual persons. And uh, well... Then five guys came here and looked at the building that it's such a nice building, it should have a distillery in it. And that's when uh, the story number three started. And that was a really interesting history lesson. We've been talking now for more than 25 minutes <laughs> just about the history of this area. And now we're, we're going to come to talk about Kuro as a distillery. Tell me a little bit about the idea. Where did the idea for Kuro distillery actually come from? Actually, everything started from a sauna, okay. <laughs> as it as it would do being in Finland. <laughs> exactly. So, 10th of May 2012, there was a bunch of us guys in a sauna, and Mika Lippi, and currently our CEO, gave us a whiskey tasting. And uh, when we got to rye whiskey, we were really amazed at how good it is. And why can't we get rye whiskey in Finland? And why nobody makes it in Finland? Because, well, rye should be Finnish. Rye whiskey should be Finnish. And um, well, yeah, then Mikko Koskinen, currently responsible for our branding, was saying that, OK, somebody should do it. And if we're going to do it, it has to be called as Rai Rai, which means also like bottoms up, let's get wasted okay. and finish. OK, OK. <laughs> and uh, then we we're considering that, OK, maturing a whiskey in Europe takes at least three years. And that's not good for your cash flow to put everything to the barrels. And... Um, then we were considering that perhaps we should do Finnish gin from Finnish botanicals. And then Mick goes quiet for a bit. Yeah, we could do that. But that has to be called as gin gin. <laughs> <laughs> like chin chin. Exactly. Yeah, okay, okay. Rai rai and chin chin. Okay, I'm with you. Exactly. And then I was saying that uh, I'm from a farm. So I don't know what a ton of rye will cost. So originally my home farm is like 10 kilometers from here. And then I said that, yeah, actually, I could know a place for the distillery as well. And originally I was thinking that we would be building everything from scratch to our dis- uh, our farm. But uh, then we got to know a bit of the requirements. And um, even though I'm a, I might be a bit slow sometimes, but as I'm living right over there, 
on the other side of the river. So as I was watching from my living room, my kitchen, my uh, fireplace room and my shower room windows, I kind of got the idea that perhaps I should visit the other side of the river and <laughs> see the old dairy if we could squeeze in there. Because by this time it was closed. Yeah, yeah. So it ha had been quiet for quite a bit, uh, qu quite a bit of time. And um, well, what happens after the sauna evening? If we get back to that, back there. So a bunch of us guys, kind of a smaller group, continued with the idea, and uh, we established a company called Rai Rai Corporation. Okay. <laughs> so the name, the name stuck in one form or another, anyway. <laughs> exactly. Later on, we considered that it might be a bit too, too tricky, so we decided to go with Gura Distillery Company. <laughs> but um, how it then went was that uh, the five of us guys really decided to go full on it and uh, all of us invested money to the company. So I was taking a loan against my house and well, Mikko didn't have his house, so he took a loan against his parents' house. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was brave of him and brave of them as well. Exactly. And um, then we got uh, also a loan from a bank that we backed up also ourselves. And then we got some EU investment funds uh, for for the initial investments. And by those three, we were able to establish the company. We got the permits on 11th of April 2014. So it's five years and a couple of days We're ago. We just, just passed your fifth birthday. Exactly. Congratulations. <laughs> and the uh, first product launch was actually on 18th, so on Thursday. It would be like uh, our fifth anniversary for that one. And, and that already you had your first product. Exactly. Good, good to go. That, that Clearly that was gin. Uh, that was actually Yuri, the ah, okay. new make. What is what is that? So that is the stuff that we put to the barrels and that becomes whiskey. Okay. So practically white dog or new make, however you want to call it. But the, it's kind of the whiskey distillate that you can't call yet whiskey. Ah, okay. So how does that taste? Well, it's kind of like a rye single malt moonshine. <laughs> <laughs> Which also has quite a nice um, throwback to Finnish culture when there was prohibition and and um, people were brewing or distilling their own. Again, in a much earlier episode, we went to Koskenkorva, Trattari, and we heard about the kind of the importance of vodka distilling to this area. Um, so you're kind of going back, going back to those roots, literally to it those roots with Yuri. Exactly. <laughs> and um, also, uh, it wasn't uh, such an easy start. Okay, we had the launch of uh, Yuri, and then on midsummer we had the launch of uh, Napue. And, uh, Napue gin. Exactly. And during 2014, we sold 4,800 bottles uh, and 100 barrels of whiskey to private uh, persons. And uh, we were practically completely broke. Okay. So, for example, to kind of to give you the kind of feel of it, so we had budgeted the salary for Galle for the whole year, uh, for Mika for half a year to be our CEO, but we didn't budget any money for branding. So uh, Mikko, who was taking care of our, our branding practically for the whole year, he had two of those startups by which we couldn't get any money from. He was doing the uh, R&D for an upward recipe with Galle for one and a half months during the spring by which we paid him and then in the latter part of the year then we were again able to pay him the actual salary but his total income from the whole year was less than 8,000 euros okay. yeah that's that's quite familiar for startups but also as somebody who's be who is still in a small company fighting to find its place it's familiar, but it's really tough being in the middle of that. Exactly. And it was like, uh, in practice, we were in a brink of bankruptcy even. Like, uh, we have two companies. We have the distillery side, and then we have a visitor center side. I was looking after visitor center money, and uh, Mika was looking after distillery. And uh, was like just balancing it out. So we're getting this money in so we can pay this invoice. Yeah, yeah. But uh, in the autumn, it got so challenging that the visitor center had to give 500 euro loan to the distillery so we can survive but we did yeah, yeah. 
And we got to 2015, Mika told us that um, we need to sell 23,500 bottles and then another 100 barrels. And we were like, yeah, right. But we went for it. We opened exports uh, bit by bit. And uh, on May, we were confident enough to purchase the rest of the empty bottles to our stock. So when we fill those ones up and they are up in the markets, then we have gotten it. Well, what happened on July? Uh, Mika got a phone call from International Wine and Spirits Competition, the eldest and most respected alcohol competition in the world, that uh, for the first time they had this gin and tonic series. And uh, one gin was nominated to be the world's best for gin and tonic, and five next ones were getting gold medals and more silvers and bronzes. And what happened there was that they told us that, okay, we have no idea about your company and what you're doing there. But... Um, what happened was that Napoe won the competition and Gosque got gold. Fantastic. It's amazing, isn't it? It Incredible was. Incredible story. And so that was, in your, that was just in the middle of your second year? Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> and we were like, oh, this, that's nice. <laughs> we had no idea what it meant. Yeah. <laughs> but what it did mean was that uh, Mika called us there, okay, put some stock in for Napoe at least. And we were like, okay, we're filling up uh, 3,000 bottles to our stock, which was the amount that our Finnish distributor ordered from us every month, one and a half months. Yeah. And uh, in Finland, you can't pro- promote a hard alcohol at all. But this was a victory in a competition, so it was news. <laughs> Aha. Yeah, yeah. So practically all of the newspapers wrote about it. So all of a sudden, we were the guys who were beating... Uh, with our gin, uh, the guys who are who have been doing that for centuries, and not only not only was it advertising, it was free advertising. Exactly, <laughs> That's, that works perfectly with a budget for a company that, ha- or for a company that has no budget for marketing. That's, <laughs> that's beautiful. <laughs> exactly, and uh, well, we got the call from our distributor, and uh, we were like, okay, here we go. We have this three thousand bottles, uh, but we were a bit surprised that they called us again in two days. For another three thousand bottles. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and then, and then the problem goes from the sublime to the ridiculous. Exactly. How do, how do we now fulfil this this demand? Exactly. We need to tenfold our production in three weeks, which is when you're manufacturing something, it's fairly challenging. Yeah, just a bit. <laughs> we were running out of uh, bottles. We were running out of labels. We were running out of everything. And uh, well, eventually we got a pace of it uh, to a better and better uh, direction. Uh, eventually what happened 2014 during the, those remaining 8 months we sold that 4,800 bottles 2015 for the first half a year we sold around 10,000 bottles and 2015 we sold a couple of bottles less than 100,000 wow, bottles incredible incredible <laughs> growth literally overnight as well exactly and it must have been this publicity that encouraged can I say James Bond to become a fan of Napoe gin how did that come about <laughs> Well, uh, actually, uh, Daniel Craig was uh, just uh, launched the um, uh, James Bond and was touring uh, with kind of a uh, promoting that around the world a bit. And uh, if I remember right, one beer brand paid around seven million euros, if I'm right, to get that advertising campaign on that movie. And uh, well, he came to Finland and. Um, one of the reporters gave him a bottle of Napoe and took a picture on that. But uh, that also caused it to ask us, uh, well, we gave a, gave a new bottle to this reporter. You gave a whole bottle? It the whole, whole bottle. bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so not only have you got the press writing stories for you, you've also got the press creating stories <laughs> for you and more free marketing. It's, exactly. in, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, so that continued from there. 2016, we sold 350,000 bottles and 2017, 430,000 bottles. So there's no l- lending of 500 euros between the two companies anymore, really? Well, uh, now we are lending a lot more money, but not from the other company. <laughs> um, and for a company that I know has put a lot of effort into the branding, it's everywhere around where we are now. It's very distinctive. There have even been some rip-offs of your branding overseas, which is both an insult and a, and a compliment as well, um, then these kind of accidental advertisings have, have, have done you a lot of have done you a lot of good. So, what are the what are the plans for the future when it comes to the products or or the brand or or the company in general? Well, 
a couple of years ago, we had the option of uh, kind of a stay in put and uh, just playing with the things that we had there. So we got the Napua sales up, but we did uh, some whiskey production and so on and so forth. Well, we decided not to. <laughs> <laughs> no, no sitting back and enjoying things. No. Okay. So we started with uh, Kura 3.0. So a plan for the next four years is to do something that n practically no one has done before. Okay. So what we are going to do, well, what we did already was that we did a financing round, got some money in, took a lot of loan, and uh, now we have investment plans for the coming next years. And that meant that uh, this dairy property that used to be won uh, and then after 2008 was sold to pieces, now we have been able to purchase the buildings around okay. to get the kind of a old heart of Isokura back as a whole. Uh, then we needed some uh, storage space, so we built a barrel warehouse to the other, other side of the road, uh, and that is uh, that can fit up to one million liters of whiskey okay. distillate. So I think that is the biggest whiskey di whiskey kind of a warehouse uh, in Finland, and uh, it's at the same time perhaps the biggest laboratory because we can adjust yeah. temperatures and and so on and so forth. We can monitor everything there. Then again. Now we are building up, as you might hear, some uh, <laughs> also trucks and so on. So we are building up a new whiskey distillery just uh, to the other side of the yard. And uh, that will enhance our whiskey production to a completely different uh, scale. At the same time, we are also doing uh, kind of a marketing or market research and uh, just uh, branding a bit. But um, then one huge thing is to push the markets, uh, export markets, and to get a foothold there. So all in all, our goal is to grow a lot during the next years. And uh, the scale that we are aiming for is the sort of a size that no one has done before uh, ever from flat ground. And, 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 within, and within five years. Basically, exactly. So this is now kind of the journey that we want to go to. It's going to be really difficult, and we don't know where, where the journey takes us. But um, in 2022, we would like to be the world's best known rye distillery, and we want to be here for for a very long time. So we want to make something that will have a heritage, also. I think you're. I think you're well on your way. My journey is now taking me. Inside, we're going on a tour of the distillery with Kalle, um, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, I think I'm coming back in the summer. I've already made my plans, um, but I appreciate it. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much. It has been really pleasant. And please also, the listeners, come and enjoy the ride with uh, Rai. And I'll, I'll make sure that I put some links on the show notes so they can see what you've got going on here and uh, I'll even see if I can find the image with James Bond so they know what we're talking about. I think this will probably go as a standalone yeah. podcast because yeah. I think it's it's really interesting in itself and it leads up perfectly to what Kalle maybe is going to tell us shortly. So Mikko Heinila, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So I think that just about wraps up today's show. I'd like to say a big thank you to Mikko Heinila for a fantastic experience. If you enjoy the show, you want to show your support, then please take a minute to rate and review the show on iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts. It will help me raise the profile of the show. Connect with me on Facebook, that's Explore Finland Radio Show, Twitter, at Explore Finland, and Instagram, which is Mark underscore Explore Finland, or on the website, explorefinlandpodcast.com. Of course, you could also spread the word to your friends on your social network of choice. Let them know about the show and invite them to Explore Finland with us. And also, if there's a subject you want me to cover in a future episode, you can contact me via the website or social media, like Keith did. I'd be happy to hear from you and your ideas. If you want more, search for your podcast player for the recent Atari Zoo podcast miniseries or the Finnish football show. Otherwise, until next time, thanks for listening and see you again on the Explore Finland radio show. Bye.